Now please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Mr. Walt Amer. Well, hello. Um, thank you all for being here. I ever get a chance to speak to a group and that they don't work for me, I always wonder if anyone's going to show. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad you all are here. Uh, although I am kind of curious why everyone runs to you know, listen to what's going on at the Waffle House. Um, Joe Owens here from the Alumni Association. I'm fortunate to work with him on Alumni Association stuff. And part of that is I get to speak at graduation. And I'm the last speaker, so everyone's excited to get done and be through with me. And I know that these parents who spent all this money putting their kids through school are wondering why a cook from the Waffle House is addressing them on their final uh, commencement day. Um, so all right, let me get a little show of hands here. Um, how many customers are with me? Every, who's eating with us? Oh, that warms my heart. All right, is there anybody here who has not eaten with us? It's OK. It's OK. We got one? Oh, a couple. Good. All right. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about Waffle House. Um, what, one of the things that's really amazing about our business is the regular customer base that we have. And our regular customers are folks that we get to know every day. I see a guy in Atlanta almost every time I stop in a Waffle House. His name's Randy. Do you know Randy, Megan? This is, this is Megan Irwin, by the way. Megan's uh, from our office. She is from the University of Georgia. Um, <laughs> the, uh, is, this, is this one of your daughters, Joe? The, the related? Uh, yes, yeah, she, dressed, she dressed appropriately. Um, the funny story is last time I spoke, I think in this room, we couldn't figure out the video that I had played. And so we have all these smart Georgia Tech people here. And my communications guy said, I'm sending the UGA grad to figure it out. So apparently, the video is going to work fine. Thank you for being here, Megan. And before I forget, um, Megan has brought some free waffle coupons because I always bribe people who uh, will sit through a presentation of mine. So um, I think on your way out, we'll put some coupons on the table and uh, feel free to come have a free waffle on us and, uh, and learn a little bit about, uh, after you learn a little bit about what we do. Um, but this fellow, Randy, who Megan hasn't met yet, eats with us every day of the week. You know, I think of a regular customer as someone who, you know, eats with us a couple times a month, two or three times a month. This guy eats every day of the week, and he has the exact same thing every time. He pulls into the parking lot, they say, there's Randy, and it doesn't matter what restaurant, he goes to about five or six different restaurants around town, and it's always a cheese omelet, wheat toast, and sliced tomatoes. He's had the same thing for breakfast for 20 years, seven days a week, and he's that big around. I mean, he is... Uh, he, and we put him on our calendar one year because he was so wonderful. Um, so anyways, here's what I'd like to do today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Waffle House for those who don't know and maybe those who are curious about why uh, we do what we do. Um, I thought I'd talk about leadership at Waffle House and really what it boils down to. Um, there's really nothing that complicated about our business. It's all about the people that are running those restaurants on a daily basis uh, and what they do and how they do it. And we teach people how to manage and lead kind of the Waffle House way, if you will. So that's the title of the speech. Um, I have been, uh, I've had my arm twisted to talk a little bit about my journey since I got out of this place. Um, I mean, graduated, excuse me. Um, so I'll, tr I'll touch on that, but that'll be a brief part of the speech. And then, uh, and then I'd love to take any questions and answers you have. So um, real quick. Um, Waffle House history. We're 58 years old this year. We started right here in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a couple of urban legends that are not true. The Waffle House was not founded in the basement of the Alpha Omega Fraternity House. That one is apparently on the tour, um, but that's not the case. But Joe Rogers Jr. was an ATO. His dad started the company. Uh, and Joe, when he was going to school here, would go work at the Waffle House and everyone else was going to the parties. Uh, and I have independent confirmation on that. That's not just his story. Uh, we actually had a restaurant way back then on 10th and Peachtree, if you can imagine. It's one close. Now we've got one a little bit closer. Uh, but Waffle House was founded in 1955, same year as McDonald's. They grew a little bit bigger than we did. Um, and they're continuing to grow. Uh, but we found our own little niche of success, I guess, if you will, in a kind of a different way. Uh, two friends started the business. 
And as I mentioned, it started here in Atlanta and it grew very slowly at first. Um, Joe Rogers Sr. is really the restaurant guy. Tom Forkner, his partner, was the real estate guy. So it started out as kind of this partnership between two people. Uh, Joe Rogers Jr., after graduating from Georgia Tech, uh, here in this college, college was called the College of Management, um, ultimately went to the Harvard Business School. When he came out of Harvard Business School, he took over the company as CEO at the age of 26. Um, and up until this past May, he had been the CEO of the business for nearly 40 years. Um, so it's, uh, we've got continuity of leadership, if you will. And Joe's still around today, and there's some, some of his friends are in the audience. Um, so hopefully they'll report back nicely to him on me. Um, but um, Joe's our chairman, and uh, his son is now in the business, uh, running a division for us down in Jacksonville, Florida. So family-owned business, privately held. Um, we've grown now to uh, nearly 1,700 restaurants. Uh, we're in 25 states. We've been in. We added one state in my 20-year career. Uh, we were in 24 states when I started 20 years ago, so it's rapid growth. Um, <laughs> but really, it's very consistent growth. Uh, when I started, there were probably about uh, 800 restaurants. Um, we've grown now. We're private. We don't really report a lot of stuff. It's not that big of a secret, though. We're a billion-dollar business now. We'll probably be at $1.1 billion this year. Um, most of those restaurants are owned and operated by us. Uh, we have franchisees, about 35 of them, who operate close to 20% of the restaurants. And most of those restaurants, we own the land and the building. Um, so we're a very involved uh, company in what we do, and we are restaurant operators. Some other restaurant companies are you know, marketers or franchisors or you know, lots of different things. Um, but we've, we fancy ourselves restaurant operators. I don't normally wear a suit. I wore a suit for you guys today. Uh, and, uh, and we get behind the counter and we do a lot of things. So we compete in a very saturated industry as well. Uh, the only way we get business is to take it from somebody else, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon because in our business, uh, the history of the majority of our business was the restaurant industry was a growth industry. And all you had to do was kind of the field of dreams thing. If you build it, they will come. Uh, we, had to, we had to get very good at building restaurants. And we did that. Um, but now it's to the point where there's, if you want to go out to eat at a restaurant, there's no trouble finding one. And, um, and so it's a very competitive industry now and a very thin margin business. We're very people heavy for a company our size, uh, which is not you know, small, but it's not gigantic. Uh, we have over 30,000 people that work with us. So it's, a, um, it's quite, a, quite a people enterprise, if you will, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, speaking of regular customers, um, that's Shaquille O'Neal. Now, I was with a guy who runs our New Orleans restaurants and the last two days, and he just came from the Super Bowl he didn't go to the Super Bowl, but he worked the Super Bowl. Not the Super Bowl, but the Waffle House. Um, and he was in a Waffle House on Reed Boulevard in New Orleans, and Shaquille O'Neal was there. And he got talked to Shaquille, and Shaquille was there by himself, and he had, had breakfast, and he tipped everybody $20, and they were happy. And uh, then he moved on down the road. This picture's from this morning at Piedmont and Far Road. Shaquille O'Neal is a good customer of ours. Um, it just so happened that our marketing guy, our, our communications guy, was there um, meeting with somebody uh, and in walked Shaquille O'Neal. I said, who is he with? He said, he was by himself. He sat at the low counter. This is Shorty. <laughs> Shorty's four foot seven or something like that. So it, it was a fun day um, for the folks over in, um, at Piedmont and Far Road. Um, and, uh, you know, he's just a wonderful guy. He paid, paid for his bill, tipped everybody there, 20 bucks. That's his deal, uh, apparently. And uh, he's just a nice guy and comes into the Waffle House. Why does Shaquille O'Neal come into the Waffle House when he could eat anywhere, he could afford anywhere in the world? Let me show you a little clip real quick about Waffle House. Waffle House. Waffle House. 
the Waffle House. The Waffle House. I love Waffle House. You know, Waffle House is ubiquitous down there. It's literally and the best food. When Beyonce came to Atlanta, the Jay-Z met up with her. They really kept it real. They went to dinner at places like the Waffle House. I'm here with Super Couple, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw. You guys going out later tonight? Ron, it's 2 a.m. You're starving. Where is your favorite place to eat? Waffle House. Waffle House. Oh, yeah. Waffle House. Yeah. Oh, me too. Please welcome the one and only Kid Rock. supposed to be reporting on the Waffle House? What you think? Mm, you got the <coughs> Waffle House hands. He's a homespun Florida way of describing uh, how he handles his professional duties. He calls it the Waffle House test. If you're allergic to waffles, don't eat waffles. <laughs> then don't take me to a Waffle House. <laughs> We still wonder why y'all talk so much about us. I, um, um, we don't do anything that complicated. Um, I was talking with Joe Rogers Jr. the other day, our chairman, and we were talking about successful, enduring companies. And someone wrote recently, there's four, they did a study, there's four key characteristics of companies that endure. Uh, first characteristic is strategy. Second, execution, third, people, and fourth, cash. And we said, hmm, 58 years, we've done the same thing for 58 years. We haven't changed our strategy at all. Um, we kind of know who we are and, uh, and what we do and what we do well. We've never varied very much at all off the path of what we do. And as we you know, think about what our competitive advantage is, I, I would tell you, I think our lasting competitive advantage is that we do things that other people won't do, not that they can't do. There's nothing about what we do that you can't copy. Now, granted, I think the vast majority of that press is because we're open 24 hours. I mean, I, I would like to, I, I really would blame, uh, not blame it, but I would give credit to two things. One, the 24-hour business, and a lot of you who've eaten with us probably have eaten in the middle of the night. Uh, you are fun people generally in the middle of the night. Um, not always in the, <laughs> you're usually fun till about three. After three, you become less fun. Um, and then the other piece is the relationship side. We get to know our customers very well. I know Randy, I, I don't, I'd invite him to my house. Um, I, I'd invite Shaq too, but I don't know if he'd come. Um, but we, we get to know our customers, we get to know our associates. It's a very social environment. We used to call it Cheers Without Beers, for those of you who remember the uh, TV show Cheers from a long time ago, um, where everybody knows your name. And that's, that's kind of what we do. So from a strategic standpoint, um, that's, there, it isn't that complicated, but we think we've got the right strategy. And in large part, we don't vary at all from that strategy. Um, as an example, oftentimes people ask the questions, why do you have restaurants right across the street from one another? Why don't you just build a bigger restaurant? Well, because we know how to run that restaurant. That small little shoebox with windows is what we know how to run. We don't know how to run a 100 seat restaurant, we know how to run a 40 seat restaurant. And so instead of building a bigger one, if we got a lot of demand, we'll just put one across the street. We have often used this excuse when asked about it by reporters, they say, well, why do you have restaurants right across the street from each other? And we say, well, our chairman is getting kind of old and he forgot we had one over there. So, and we haven't been fired yet for saying that. So, um, so that's good. Uh, but from a strategy standpoint, we feel good about strategy. Execution. Uh, let me play the next little video clip real quick. The Waffle Houses of Louisiana and Mississippi are proving to be safe houses. 
from shell-shocked customers and for hundreds of employers. After Katrina struck, Waffle House managers from Texas, the Carolinas, and Georgia were dispatched to the worst-hit areas, and generators and supplies were trucked in, allowing more than 60 of the 100 stores initially shut down by Katrina to reopen quickly. You can run a business like a business, or you can run a business like a family, and we run it like a family. That's Bert. For those of you who don't know Bert, Bert's a Georgia Tech guy, played football here, worked for us for 35 years or so, just retired not too long ago. And he was kind of our A number one general during Hurricane Katrina. Um, when we start teaching leadership to our folks, the number one thing we teach is what we call rule one. And everybody in our company knows what rule one is. And you'll find yourself in a meeting or standing in a restaurant sometime and you'll be talking to someone about something that's not quite right and you'll hear that voice and someone will say, what's rule one? And rule one for us is show up. Simple, seems very basic, and for some reason there are always more cars heading away from a storm than heading towards a storm and a storm can be whatever it can be a storm or it can be a problem it can be whenever we whenever we encounter something that is difficult our rule is to show up and not send somebody to come back with a report is to show up and figure out what needs to be done and that's what we started to do with with hurricanes we didn't have as much exposure to uh, hurricane markets 30 years ago, but as we built more and more restaurants along these coasts, when hurricanes come in, well, that's a significant opportunity. We've gotten a lot of press for what we do after hurricanes, and I can promise you, we don't really do anything that sophisticated. Uh, we've had a lot of people come and want to talk to us and want us to come talk to them. I talked to the International Disaster Conference and Expo in New Orleans last year. It was me and and Craig Fugate, the head of FEMA, and Tom Ridge, the first Homeland Security Director. I thought, why is the Waffle House guy standing up in front of these people? And they think we do something sophisticated, and the only thing we do is we just show up. And we show up and we go to work. And we, and we send a lot of people in there, and we send a lot of resources in there, and we just start figuring out what needs to be done. When Hurricane Katrina hit, I was in a rental car. Um, the day after the storm, I had to bring it in from Pensacola. It was the closest you could fly into. And it was driving on what used to be the road along the beach and looking at the devastation, trying to figure out what, what we had. And we had lost eight restaurants completely, just lost them, gone. Uh, all those other 100 restaurants I mentioned, we, we had practically all of those restaurants open before anybody else opened up another restaurant. And why? Because we just showed up and started going to work. And we figured it out as, as we were there. Matter of fact, funny story, when we went Hurricane Rita, for those of you who remember, it's starting to be a little bit dated now, Hurricane Katrina, hard to believe. Hurricane Rita, when it came in to Beaumont, Texas, later that storm year, we showed up again. And we're, Bert and I are driving through Beaumont. We're the only people in Beaumont. Driving, trying to figure out what's going on with our restaurants there. And we came up on a checkpoint, a state patrol officer checkpoint. And getting around after, after a hurricane is tough because the government, the authorities will lock it down. They do not want looters and all that stuff. Of course, we want to get our restaurants open. We're kind of selfish. So Bert and I roll up, and we're this big old Texas state trooper. I mean, big fella, big hat, you know, they wear. He comes out of the car, and Bert and I roll up, and Bert rolls the window down, and he looks in, and he sees us sitting there with our Waffle House name tags and our, and our cook shirts on. He says, we were expecting y'all. <laughs> Where you been? Go on through it. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, it's not complicated, uh, and it's what we do. And then the one other thing, the other big thing we teach people when you show up is something we call, it's from a, one of those little leadership pamphlets, and it was on page 11. So we refer to it as page 11. And it's see reality and take action. It's very simple stuff. It's very simple business. Um, but it's amazing how many folks will kind of hide behind stuff and kind of rationalize things and, and treat things differently. So execution, um, strategy we feel good about. Execution, we think we've got a pretty good handle on. Next thing would be people. Let me show you what some of our folks do. Uh, you can learn a little bit about people. Thank you. 
from this year um, Dave Dave runs uh, he lives here in Atlanta he runs 400 restaurants um, and he is a 40 year old Cornell guy responsible for about a quarter of our system uh, and I I like that piece because I think it captures a lot of different elements um, uh, Bill Todd's here in the room and we we've talked a lot about servant leadership and you know we don't really talk about servant leadership but in a sense I think that's what it is uh, we don't ask anybody to do anything that we wouldn't do ourselves. I tell folks it's hard to get a big ego when you're cleaning toilets every day. Uh, and that's what we do. We show up, we go to work, we figure out what needs to be done. Uh, and, you're, and we're working side by side with our folks every day. And a couple other things we teach in that regard. One of the, the first thing on our brand of leadership card is uh, it's all about the customers and associates. And we, we continually preach to our folks that it's got to be about the customers, it's got to be about our associates. You know, we come second. There's nothing, the higher up you go in the organization, the less privileges you have, really. Uh, because the people below you need to go home first, the people below you need time off first. Uh, and we try and take care of the folks who work for us and take care of our customers every day. Um, and the other thing we try and teach folks is it's not about you. It's, I mean, you, you, you hear people say, oh, you got to look out for yourself. If you don't look out for yourself, nobody else will. Um, when you get into management, you got to quickly realize it is not about you. And it's about making the people who work for you successful. And the people who struggle with that don't, don't fit in our culture. And they usually wash out. Uh, every conversation I've ever had with Dave is talking about his people. I don't think one time we've ever sat and talked about his needs, his money, his time, his... It's always about some situation involving some of his folks that we need to address. And that culture of we take care of our people and our people take care of our customers is kind of pervasive through. And I, I think about servant leadership. I was going to tell, come up with a Waffle House story. I'll tell a George Tech story. So a um, few months ago, the folks here at George Tech asked us to cater a breakfast at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And I said, sure, we'd love to do that. And they said, well, where's your nearest restaurant? I said, not very close. We got one in Virginia, but it's about 45 minutes away. So we flew up to Virginia, and Dr. Peterson came. He was there, and we met him at the Capitol, and his staff was there, and we had the entire George delegation we cooked breakfast for. So after, after the breakfast, the crew that went up there were going to get a tour of the Capitol. They'd never 
all the folks that we took um, had never been to the Capitol, never been to D.C. before. And so that we, one of the senator's offices set up this tour afterwards, and I, I said to Dr. Peters, I said, Bud, he said, do you mind if we, you know, wait a little bit before we go back so these folks can look around? He says, oh, sure, sure. And uh, he says, I'll tell you what. He says, why don't we let them take the tour? You and I will load the car. I said, okay. So Bud and I are, you know, carrying stuff out to the car, and, and, and your president is, you know, getting waffle batter on him, and he's, you know, sticking stuff in a minivan and doing all this stuff. Um, and by the same token, we have a, a lady that works with Megan, who is kind of our R&D person. And she was, uh, she's probably, I don't know how old Angela is, 30, early 30s. And she's giving butt orders. Okay, would you move that table over here and do this, that, and the other? And he's just, you know, snapping to it. I mean, and you see pictures of Bud unloading freshmen's bags and dorms and stuff. It's not an act. That, that's who he is. And it's very, very much from that perspective, a servant leadership culture that I know that he's trying to um, drive here. And we certainly drive in our, in our business as well. All right. Last uh, of the four, cash. You're going to like this one. Dance. <laughs> uh, we're currently we're at unit number 1684, uh, which is right off of Webgen. And I must say we are having a great time. <laughs> All right, we'll see you in the restaurants. Thanks. This is Vicus. Bye. So what in the world does the dumpster dance have to do with cash? Um, my favorite dumpster dance I did with Bert one time. Oh, well, actually, he helped me into the dumpster so I could do the dumpster dance. And. Um, we were down in Mardi Gras, and the dumpster was overflowing. And you know, what do you do? You know, so he says, "Let me teach you the dumpster dance." So you know, I'm thinking, "This is great. It's going to be like that." No, Bert was standing on the ground telling me what to do. Um, and then our executive vice president came out the back door and just about had a fit because we were both co-presidents at the time. And he's like, "I got the two presidents of the company doing the dumpster dance." And uh, so the dumpster dance. You know, we talked about. Um, we talked about serving leadership and doing all these things, whatever else. We are a privately held company that is owned by the employees, and we turn off the lights when we leave the room. And instead of throwing money at problems, we figure out ways to solve them sometimes by, whatever, I don't know if you call it ingenuity or just uh, sheer you know, need. Um, but we, li we lead a very frugal company. We're not cheap, but we don't waste money. And so in times like that, um, you know, what, what you'd see is, well, you could change the dumpster pickup, and they could come a lot more frequently, and it costs you a lot more money. Well, occasionally there's a little surge, and our folks are willing to climb into the dumpster and do the dumpster dance. And there is a technique. Uh, I hadn't seen the gangham style technique before, but uh, that fellow did, did go to the University of Georgia, so uh, no offense, Megan. <laughs> um, the guy shooting the video is one of our senior vice presidents. Uh, and I, I saw that in a restaurant just a couple days ago, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that to everybody. All right, so strategy, execution, people, cash. And we think, we think we're pretty well covered in those four parts. But I, I would agree with that article in that, that those are certainly characteristics of an enduring company. All right, real quick, my journey, and, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to uh, end with maybe a couple bits, little bits of advice, if you will, or maybe my observations of what makes some of our folks very successful. My journey out of this place is relatively uneventful. The only one who really was ever interested in that was my mother. Um, but um, kind of funny story in a sense, I was an ATO at Georgia Tech, and there's a fellow I went to school with named Tom Noonan. Some of you might know that name. He was an ATO at Georgia Tech. I was president of ATO at Georgia Tech. Tom was a president before me at ATO at Georgia Tech. Tom went to go work for a company called Allen Bradley when he graduated. I went to go work for a company called Allen Bradley when I graduated. Tom left Allen Bradley and he went to go work for DMB Software. I left Allen Bradley to go work for Waffle House. Tom made one more move. Tom went and left DMB Software and went hooked up with Chris Klaus to start Internet Security Systems, or I think that's what it was called, ISS, we all call it. And then they sold that company for 
several hundred million dollars, and Tom does whatever Tom wants to do now. I'm still cooking. Um, so I figured if I would stop, if I would have made one more move, one more move. So I, I left this, uh, my engineering job after three years on a chance at this wa to come do this Waffle House thing, mainly because there's tons of Georgia Tech people that work for Waffle House. We have more Georgia Tech graduates than any other college uh, in the country uh, that you know, at our company. Um, and so I had a lot, of, a lot of value in terms of knowing the people you're going to come work with. Uh, I started out in the purchasing department. I worked my way through. I became the director of purchasing. Um, and then in 1998, I think it's the only day I ever missed work. <clears throat> and I was sick. I mean, I was real sick. Fever, chills, the whole deal. I called my boss and said, I can't come in today. He said, OK. I said, I'll, I'll probably be there tomorrow, but I'll see. About it, <clears throat> an hour later, the executive vice president called me. And he said, well, where are you? I said, well, I said, well I'm sick in the bed. I, said, you know, and I could just tell this angst in his voice. And he said, uh, Joe wanted to meet with you. I said, well, I can come in. I don't look good, but I, I'll be here. He actually thought about it. He said, no, nah, that's all right. Just call me tomorrow. So I pulled myself out of bed the next day. I wasn't feeling great, but I was feeling better. I go into the office. I have a meeting with Joe and this EVP, not knowing what it's about. And I sat across from Joe, and he says, we're thinking about naming you VP of Finance. And I sat there and said, what? And I thought back about two weeks earlier, I passed Joe in the hallway, and he stopped me, and he said, hey, Walt, do you know how to balance your checkbook? <laughs> and I thought it was a bizarre question. But I answered yes, so apparently I passed. <laughs> and that was it. And two weeks later, he makes me VP of Finance. So don't worry, we're a private company. If you have any public stocks, they're not in our company. And the CFO, who doesn't know anything about finance, is not responsible for your investments. But um, so we had a controller at the time who um, was way more qualified for the job. He was a CPA. He had all these financial. He'd been there longer than me. He was a good guy, a good manager. Uh, and he wasn't very happy about this. And he called Joe and said, I'd like to talk to you about it. How come Walt's? He doesn't even know what finance is. He doesn't even know how to spell it. Um, and so what he told him was, well, Walt has demonstrated that he can get things done. That's what I want my finance guy. That was it. That was the entire job criteria qualification. And that really kind of changed my career at that point. Because I got into finance, came to CFO, started managing lots of multiple things. And then in uh, 2006, he made me president and put me over the top of operations. And I am an anomaly. Um, I am the only person in the entire chain of command in the restaurant operations, which where the vast majority of our people are, who didn't start out wash, uh, washing dishes in a single restaurant. Technically, I did, but I did it only for a week. Um, I didn't, like Dave, he started out managing a restaurant, then three restaurants, then nine restaurants. And I didn't start that way, so I'm an anomaly. I'm also the first non-family CEO in the company's history. And I might be the last if Joseph uh, uh, you know, grows into that job. You never know. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a fun job for me. And I'm, I'm actually, I love my job probably more every day. Um, here's a couple things, and I'll, I'll open up for questions. Um, they, I don't think there's a, there's a recipe for success. I think there's a lot of different things and a lot of different characteristics that work into it. I think for me, if, it, if I look back on my career, the one thing that maybe I did, uh, well, maybe there's two. Uh, one is I worked really hard. And I think, I think that's why we do really well with Georgia Tech graduates. Because people who make it out of this place work really hard. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the most basic uh, criteria for a Georgia Tech graduate. Well, at least you know they work really hard, because they had to get out of there. Um, and so I think Georgia Tech teaches you that. And I think I've always kind of had that in my blood, if you will. And I love the J. Paul Getty quote, the, the oil baron from a long time ago, who someone asked him one time what the secret of success was. And he said, rise early, work hard, strike oil. So now, I <clears throat> wasn't so successful on the third one, uh, but we cook with oil. Um, but, you know, Getty believed you need to get up early. I get up early every morning. 
Speaking of your president, Joe knows, Joe Irwin knows this. I was, it was a couple days before Christmas, I was working in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Joe and I were trying to set up a meeting with the president on something, some alumni association deal. And I got up early, 4.30, and turned on my computer, start checking emails. There's an email from Bud about, you know, how's this date work or whatever else. And so I just replied back, yeah, that works for me. It was great. I got my calendar out. It works for me. So then I, you know, proceed to do my thing, finish working at the, in the hotel room, get dressed. We get to the restaurants at 6.30 in the morning. Um, and I'm in the restaurant at 6.30. I feel my phone go off, and I, I pull it out, and I look at it, and there's an email from Bud. So I, you know, when you're on the phones, you, you can't, I mean, unless you're going to stand there and look at it. You kind of glance at it real quick. I'll get around to reading that later. And I, there's two things that jumped out at me. The word cheetah and gazelle. So, what is, so I read it. Well, I've had this in my desk or taped to my computer both at home and at the office since 1991. And the quote is this. Every morning in Africa, there is a gazelle that awakens, knowing that if it wants to survive, it must outrun the fastest lion. On the same morning, a lion awakens, knowing it must outrun the slowest gazelle if it will survive or starve to death. You see, it doesn't matter if you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better be hauling. And for any of you who've communicated with Dr. Peterson before, that email he sent to me was from, I don't know, before 4.30 in the morning. Uh, so rise early, work hard. I think that's the secret to success. The other one, uh, and I feel like I've done a decent job with this one, but people who are successful in our business have, and that's what we preach to people is build strong relationships. Um, it's a great place to go to school here because you meet lots of people. You'll end up building these wonderful networks of alumni that you can deal with. And the ability to deal with folks and build strong relationships uh, is an amazing skill uh, and yet very essential, I think, to being successful. And certainly in our company, all that FEMA stuff, all that, you know, they keep talking about us. That confirmation hearing of uh, Craig Fugate, we didn't even know who he was. And all of a sudden, C-SPAN showing him talking about Waffle House. Uh, so what do I do? Pick up the phone, call Craig Fugate. Hey, want to come meet you? Um, Why? Well, I, I don't know. He was, you know, he was talking about us. I flew to D.C. He talked for two hours. You think I tell stories. He talked for two hours and told nothing but Waffle House stories. And I kept thinking the staffers are going to try to get us out of here. But ever since then, we've now got this almost partnership with FEMA where they call us, we call them. Uh, they've helped open many doors for us. A lot of the problems with these hurricanes is getting doors open so that you can get back in business because a lot of the authorities try to shut you down. Um, build strong relationships. One of the other ones, I, our friends at Coca-Cola, I, I think I'm infamous for this to this day. I was still a, kind of a junior guy in the company, and I wasn't happy with Coca-Cola with the way they were giving us a price increase. So I called the president of the Coca-Cola company. Um, I was frustrated, and I, you know, I was professional, and everybody below him knew I was calling him. Um, and he called me back in his cell phone. He, was driving, he's, he told me later, he says, I was driving down the road by Bobby Jones Golf Course down North Side Drive or whatever. He said, and what I asked him to, he says, I almost ran off the road. Um, now, I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get the price decrease that I wanted. But we ended up with this other contractual thing. That we ended up signing this lifetime contract. And we're never going to not sell Coca-Cola. I mean, come on. Waffle House. <laughs> Atlanta. We're not going to do Pepsi salesman done it, has never called on us. There's no way we're going to ever do business with Pepsi. But because of those relationships, we, we started to develop that kind of, uh, kind of structure for a future relationship, and it led to significant cost reductions in our, in our doing business with Coca-Cola, all because we, we kept building these relationships, building these relationships. So, um, And then a couple last things real quick, and I promise I'll, I'll stop. Um, once you get the job, our, uh, our motto to folks who want to get ahead and take the next job is to make yourself the obvious choice. And it sounds simple. A lot of everything I say sounds simple, actually. Um, but it's amazing how many folks, you know, just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm here. I've been doing this. Why, why don't they come to me and, and ask me to, 
to do more. The people who get to do more in our company are the folks who've gone out of their way to make themselves the obvious choice by preparing themselves, by acting like they're in the next job, by doing a lot of different things, so that when people are selecting folks, there's no selection. It's, it's that person, you're the obvious choice. And that's, those are the folks that do, do best in our, uh, in our business. And then lastly, um, and I think this really plays off of maybe my first choice to ever come to Waffle House, it was something I thought about at the time, is when you're thinking about starting a career or changing careers, uh, build off a very strong foundation. Um, Waffle House is a debt-free business, privately held. No matter what happens in the world, we say we're depression-proof. Uh, we think we'll be the last business standing. Uh, it's wonderful when you don't have any debt, as Joe Rogers' dad, who's 93, says, you know, it's hard to go out of business when you don't owe anybody any money. Um, and so working off a very stable, solid platform enables you to concentrate on your career and the work that needs to be done and not all the stuff that kind of knock, take your knees out from underneath you. Uh, and so having a very strong company, uh, and back to the dumpster dance, um, we, we have a business that's very stable and withstands the test of time. Uh, and so as you think about careers and stuff, I mean, you can take risks. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that you know, we'll never be the next Apple computer. Um, but there's growth and stability, and that's a pretty nice little formula to build a career off of. So anyways, that's, that's about all I could think to tell you about Waffle House and uh, our leadership traits and characteristics that people do well in our business. And hopefully, uh, hopefully I answered some of your questions. And I'm happy to answer any more questions you might have about our business or what's going to be the next item on the menu. I don't care. Whatever you want to talk about. Um, I know we've got a few minutes. and. Uh, Questions. I th what they want to do is come. <clears throat> they, they're, they're recording this for some reason. I don't know who's ever going to watch it, but that's why you need the microphone so you'll, you know, they can get your voice in there. Awesome. So. Awesome. The question I have is, what do you know now that you wish you had known back when you first started your business career? What do I know now that I wish I'd known back then? Um, you know, there were things that maybe I, I didn't know that I knew, but they became obvious to me later. Um, clearly, clearly, I didn't have a, I didn't really have a concept of how important it was to have a good reputation. I mean, it seems kind of silly to say that, but. You know, I think that most of the people who succeed in our business, and probably in a lot of businesses, not because you do a really good job. It's because a lot of people think very well of you. Because you've done a good job repeatedly across multiple, multiple areas. Um, I didn't really comprehend that so much when I got out of school, that, that the, the value, and it gets back to building strong relationships. It's not just building a relationship with the guy at the Coca-Cola company or the guy in Washington. It's building strong relationships with everybody you work for, it's how you treat people. I mean, I, fortunately, I've never been inclined to think about anybody differently than anybody else. But be it the the cook or the salesperson or the janitor at the office or Joe Rogers Jr. Treat everybody the same, and you'll be surprised and amazed at how lots of people that you would never think can ultimately play into the reputation that you build and. You know, when a lot of people say nice things about you, it sure is easy to, to, to take a shot at, you know, putting you in a bigger job as an example. So um, that would be one. I'm sure there's others, but that's one. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, you talked about how the company's operational strategy hasn't changed much over the years. <laughs> um, has the company's vision or mission evolved at all since you've been at Waffle House? Um, yeah, uh, well, opera, you know, everything changes. It's just we have a motto that says change slowly and only for good reason. Um, we also talk a lot about the tortoise and the hare. So, you know, we're really ingenious about stuff like this. But, it, but all of those little lessons play very true in our business. Um, so the business today, if you were to pluck someone from 1970 and bring them forward to today, they would say the business is vastly different. Um, but really, you our consumer would say it's not very different at all. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of difference. We are a much more people-focused business than we were back then. Um, we talk about people, 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 people all the time. We, we almost don't talk about 
sales and profits because we talk about people so much. The recruitment of people, the selection of people, the training of people, the retention of people, and that's new. Used to be we run through people back in the 60s and 70s. We eat them up and chew them out and spit them out and, and it's, it's completely different now. Um, you know, as far as our, our strategy itself, it evolves a little bit. And the one thing I would say, and I mentioned this right at the very beginning, um, it used to be much more of a development. You know, we just got to build restaurants, make sure we staff them, and keep going. And now it is a much more competitive environment. So we talk a lot more about the competition, what they're doing, what we need to do to respond to that. And we think about taking business away from other people. Um, and I don't think we did that a long time ago. So it has evolved somewhat. Um, and that's, that is a little bit of a strategic uh, change there. Got a question in the middle. Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for coming to speak to us. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Um, as y'all have grown over the years and Wapbox has continued to grow, what's been the biggest obstacle y'all have faced in growing, but at the same time keeping that uh, friendly, like family, intimate culture that y'all have at your restaurants or, or has there been? Uh, no, there's lots of obstacles. <laughs> uh, the, um, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but uh, every obstacle in our business is people. When we, we limit our growth based on how fast we can grow our people strength. It's not financial and certainly not opportunity. I mean, we're, we're only in 25 states. We've got 235, 240 restaurants in the city of Atlanta. We're about to open one up at, at uh, Centennial Olympic Park in a couple <coughs> in a couple, uh, well, probably six weeks or so. Um, so we're still growing Atlanta, um, and we've got tons of opportunity, and yet we limit our opportunity because of the, de the ability to develop people. Um, so that, I mean, it was told to me early, if you could ever solve the people equation, you could retire real early and a rich person in this business. It's a, it's a tough business. It's 24-7, 365. I've worked every Christmas day for 20 years. Now, that sounds bad, but you know what? It really isn't. Now, it might be bad for my family, but um, then again, maybe it wouldn't be that bad. Now. So um, <laughs> maybe they're happy to see me go. Um, we have a wonderful time in our restaurants on holidays. Everyone's in a great mood. Y'all tip a lot better on Christmas Day. Um, so uh, it really is the big challenge for us is finding folks who fit in this business and are willing to stay in this business. And who can kind of kind of survive the 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 tough times? And it's tough to survive. And I mean, every business has its ups and downs. And we we always talk about you got to you got to thrive. I mean, got to survive to thrive. Um, and sometimes you do the best you can just to survive. And we always kind of come out the other side thriving. Um, but I I would say that by far, hundred weight item is getting enough folks that want to work in this business. And as far as the atmosphere and what we deliver, uh, I think we, we attack that by being in the restaurants all the time ourselves. So we know we're not perfect. We know we're not always friendly. We know we're not doing it right all the time. But we're, we learn that by being there versus by reading it on a report. Uh, and it helps attack what the real challenges are. And it usually comes down to the people we selected, how we trained them, and how we're reinforcing their behavior either the right way or the wrong way. Yes? Curious, um, from an employee relations perspective, how frequently do you visit your restaurants as CEO and as customer, and what is that like? Um, <laughs> all right, here's my, here's my routine. Mondays I'm in the office almost every week, but I usually stop by a restaurant on the way. Um, Every other day, <laughs> I'm generally in a restaurant somewhere. Now, I was in a meeting, some off-site meetings the last two days, so, maybe that, so it's not 100% of the time. Um, Dave Rickle, the guy in the video, he's, he's responsible for a quarter of our company. He does not have an office, which means he's in the restaurants every day. Um, I, I get in the restaurants all the time. I don't wear a suit. I put the same cook shirt on that they wear. Uh, I spend most of my time, at least half, showing up unannounced, as do most of our senior managers, because if they know I'm coming, I mean, it's a dog and pony show. 
you know. And you appreciate a dog and pony show sometimes because they've got such pride in what, you know, they want to show you how clean they can make it and how friendly they are. And, uh, but you guys see reality, and we need to see reality too. So we show up often unannounced. Drives people who work for you crazy because they don't know where you are and what you're going to find. And, but uh, it's really part of our culture now that it's, it doesn't really surprise anybody. Um, and, you know, what, you know, I learn a lot when I first show up. You learn a lot about how they're staffing the restaurants. You learn a lot about the way the facilities look. You learn a lot about attitudes. They can't change that quick. I mean, it's hard for me to get in the door before they recognize who you are, but they can't turn on a dime. And so you, you get a chance. Sometimes, I was with Joe one time. We were coming back from the um, Georgia Tech uh, ACC championship game, and it was, a, um, it was a restaurant I hadn't been to in years, and I was dressed in my civilian clothes. And I snuck in there, and I was not recognized. And that's so rare, though. So it's, but it's great. I mean, we had a decent experience. It was not bad. Um, but there's always something. My family won't eat with me in a Waffle House anymore, because you're always seeing stuff. You know, they should be doing that, should be doing that. But we, even though we spend all of our time in the restaurants, we are not on an inspection tour. When I'm in the restaurants, I'm, I'll cook, and I'll wash dishes, and I'll take out the trash, and I'll scrub floors, I'll do whatever I, you know, hopefully y'all are behaving in the middle of the night and I don't have to clean up anything, but I've done that. That's always, that's when the party stops being fun anymore, as soon as the first person gets sick. Doesn't. <laughs> New Year's Eve is a fun, fun night to work. And I think about our, the culture of our company. It wasn't just me out there. It was um, Joe Rogers Jr., our chairman. He's 66 years old. He worked all night long going to restaurant to restaurant, unannounced like I was, seeing, seeing reality of our business. I'll tell you this one funny story, and I'm going to lose you all here quickly. Some of you got to go to class. Some of you all are falling asleep. But um, I, was, I was left a restaurant on Old National Highway at about 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, and I stopped by a new restaurant we had on Riverdale Road. And as I pulled off the inter interstate there down by the airport, I looked over to my left, and there was McDonald's, and it was open. And they had cars wrapped around the building. I mean, wrapped around the building. I thought, damn. So then I go to our restaurant, which is just about two miles up the road, mile up the road. And I go in, and we were busy, but we weren't. They weren't wrapped around the building. I was a little disappointed. I made a mental note when I drove by that McDonald's of the last car in line. And it was easy to remember. It was this fancy-looking Camaro. So I, um, so I went in the restaurant, and everything was great. And we had one of our division managers from, like, Stockbridge who was up, because we don't do much business on New Year's Eve in Stockbridge. We do a lot around the city of Atlanta. So he was up there helping. We had, so we had senior management in the restaurant. We were staffed. Everything was going well. I stayed for a while. I tried to help, bust a table or two, wash a dish or two. They didn't need me. And I wanted to see as many people as I could. So I'm thinking, I'm leaving. I'm going to go to the Georgia Tech Waffle House. Because last year we were busy at the Georgia Tech Waffle House. So, I drove back by the McDonald's, and, I dro and the line wasn't wrapped around the building anymore, but I drove through the parking lot real quick, and that Camaro was still in line at the first pay window. They hadn't even gotten to their food yet. We had a lot of people come, sit down, eat, and go in the time it took that car to get just through the drive through And I thought, I wonder if the CEO of McDonald's is working tonight. And I guarantee you he wasn't. Uh, and it's just our culture. Our culture is just, we, we just grew up doing that. Um, and I did get to the George Tech Waffle House, and I got stuck here for three hours. Um, and I didn't leave until it was almost dawn. So uh, it was an interesting night. That's a whole another series of stories, not just a story. Yes? Yeah, OK. So um, this is great. It's actually the second time I've got to listen to you speak, so it's been awesome. Did I tell any of the same stories? Uh, maybe like one or two. <laughs> but um, I kind of had a question about, you talked about like having like a competitive advantage over or trying to steal customers away from other restaurants. Yes. And just in general, like when I walk into a Waffle House, it's got that very, I guess, like 60s almost vibe to it. You know, there's still like the old school cash register and a lot of the things are very low level. And then like all these other competitors, I guess, are investing in these crazy high tech systems. How do you guys keep up with that? Is that like, how does that work? I think someone asked me if I'd talk about how we innovate. I, I just couldn't even come up with even a story for that. Um, I'm, I'm the guy who, if you Google my name, the most stuff that comes up, other than the Student Alumni Association and, and Georgia Tech, is, uh, is when we announced that we were actually going to start accepting credit cards, which was about five years ago. Because we weren't, we weren't entirely sure they were going to make it. Um, <laughs> now, 
while it's funny and it's 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 kind of a unique thing about our brand um, that we are a throwback in a sense. Um, there's a real reason why we didn't, and it's an engineer. We're a bunch of engineers running this company. There's a real engineering reason why we didn't take credit cards. It's because it slows the transaction time down at the cash register. If you hand me a twenty-dollar bill for your seven-dollar meal, I can count back that change really quick, and you're out the door. As opposed to swiping the credit card, handing it to you, writing the tip in, getting it back. So it was kind of this this trade-off of speed of service. But I mean, heck, a hundred years from now there won't be any cash, so we had to do it. Um, same thing applies to technology. We are not opposed to technology. As a matter of fact, we, are, we invest a lot in technology. You just don't see it. It's all, it's all to help behind the scenes. Um, but we will, we will bring out some more stuff. There will be more and more stuff that becomes more and more visible because we're, we, would, we do need to utilize technology where it can help us be better as opposed to because it's neat and nice to have. And I think a lot of folks make it neat and nice to have. And we are so much quicker when you tell me that you want a patty melt plate scattered, smothered, and covered in a Diet Coke that I can turn and say, you know, pull one quarter and, and all of a sudden your, your order's cooking as opposed to going over to the terminal and, you know, punching it in and then a little ticket comes out in the kitchen somewhere. And, but it, it's also part of, it's really a big part of our concept is that call to order. You know, and, and it's, it's funny when you stand there cooking and you had not cooked an omelet in two hours and all of a sudden a ham and cheese omelet order comes in. And of course, it got yelled to you. And next thing you know, you're cooking omelets like crazy, left and right, because someone heard omelet. Hey, I think I want an omelet. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're cooking omelets. <laughs> so there is kind of this unique thing about our culture, or our concept, I should say. Um, we're not technology averse. We just don't, we just don't lead with it. Uh, but we do have a lot of effort in that regard. So. Well, I'm real glad to got those credit cards. Last time Joe was here, he said he wasn't going to do it. And so, <laughs> and so the first time I saw it, I said, what? He, <laughs> anyway. he denied any knowledge of it. So. <laughs> anyway, um, it, uh, it strikes me, uh, especially when I'm in uh, Waffle House, which is uh, a lot uh, in my town, uh, both sides of the interstate uh, on 114, on 20, uh, have them. Um, and it seems to me you're a logistics company. I mean, you never run out of anything. How many ingredients, so I, I try to sit there and count how many ingredients you have and how, gosh, the, the, gosh, those guys are so smart, they don't have that many ingredients, but I don't know how you get it to all the places uh, <laughs> and never run out of anything. So tell us a little bit about your logistics. I'd like to tell you that we never run out of anything. Um, I, was, I was in a uh, restaurant on Holcomb Bridge Road on Christmas Day last year and a fellow who works with Joe at the Alumni Association, his Coca-Cola guy, Rich D'Agostina. He was in the restaurant with his family having breakfast. I knew him, but I didn't know him real well, and I was kind of in a hurry as I came in the restaurant, and I, I got behind the counter, and we were out of Coca-Cola. Can you imagine the Waffle House being out of Coca-Cola on Christmas Day? Um, and so I was running out the front door to go buy Coca-Cola at CVS, because you know the places that are open on Christmas Day. CVS is open. Um, and so I go, and Rich stops me, and we talk for a second. I said, look, I'm in a hurry. i got to go. And I, I'm, I'm having a problem with Coca-Cola, and I just ran out the door. And of course, then he starts sweating, thinking, you know, something his company has done to us. And I, I come back in with bagfuls of two-liter bottles. Um, we, are, we are a logistics company. We are a real estate company. Um, we, we talk about ourselves being operators all the time, because we operate restaurants. Um, and our operators, there is, there is a lot of technology behind the scenes that manages that inventory. And the commissary where we keep our food is about as big as this right here. We only get deliveries once a week. And so we are, we probably have one of the most predictable businesses there is. Um, uh, we've, we have, within a few dollars, we know what we're going to do on sales on second shift at Georgia Tech today. And so when you, when you, it, it's amazing how we can be that predictable, but um, you know, and, and today might be half what a couple of days ago were. Um, so when you have a real good sense of what your demand is, it enables you to manage your inventory pretty tight. And we don't have really that many ingredients. Uh, when you look at our menu versus even an IHOP or a Denny's, but certainly like a Chili's or an Applebee's, you know, they got, it's a book, it's pages. You know, ours is pretty cut and dried, and we got bacon, and we got eggs, and we got sausage and we got ham and we got you know and you, you go through the list and we do a lot of things with the same ingredients and it's really one of kind of the secret ingredients if there is of our formula that works 
is that we try to do a lot with a few items so it keeps it from being too complicated. And yeah, we've got smart people that run by a George Tech guy, by the way, um, who runs our purchasing group that you know is working with a distribution company. And we used to be in the distribution business. One of my claims to fame was I got us out of the distribution business. Um, not because we weren't great at it, we were great at it. It's just that other people are professionals and we really are restaurant operators. Uh, but there's a lot of science and technology behind the scenes in terms of predictability of our demand. And then we're, we're just, and when you're in the restaurants, you very quickly see when you're running low on stuff and whatever else. So one of the lessons I learned early on when I started working with operations, I sat down for lunch with a guy who was running our su subsidiary business out in Arkansas. It was about 2.30 in the afternoon and I ordered a sandwich and, he, and the sandwich came and I said, can I get a pack of mayonnaise? And they said, we're out of mayonnaise. And the guy who ran the business said, no, we're not. He says, well, uh, the poor salesperson didn't know what to say, so she went and got the manager. The manager came over, and he said, we're out of mayonnaise. He says, yeah, the truck will be here in like within about an hour. He says, go get some mayonnaise. So it's, it's, it's as much a mindset of we're not going to be out. I'm not going to be out of Coca-Cola on Christmas Day. I don't care if i got to stop everything I'm doing and drive to CVS. Um, so that's, it's, it's big, big park culture, but with a lot of systems behind the scenes. Well, this will be our last question. Yeah, well, I'm told that every time Joe Rogers Jr. talks to the Harvard Business School, uh, it's always the first question, it's always the same. And, and the same with Truth Cathy of Chick fil A talks up there. And that is, when are you going to go public? <laughs> so, how do you answer that question? How do I answer that question? Never. Um, the only, you know, I've been raised there. I mean, I've spent the first few years somewhere else. And so I've been raised in a private business that is run by the family that now has continuing family involvement. Um, and he's kind of pounded into my head, the only reason you'd go public is because you needed money. And I'm very proud to admit we don't need money. So, you know, subjecting yourself to all the regulations, all of the, the extra costs associated with running a public company. Um, you know, Joe and his family are, are been very successful or very well off. They don't have a need for a big cash event. Um, and so we, we have no interest at all in running a public company, and primarily because so many of the decisions we make are such long-term focused decisions, and we don't want to get put in that position where we've got shareholders that are expecting things. Because a lot of times, we've got to make an investment in the business that might drag the profitability down. You, it's just so hard to do that with a public company. And, you know, we're an employee-owned business. We all own stock in the company. Every single manager owns stock. Every single hourly associate has the ability to own stock, um, whether they choose to participate or not. And our stock price has never gone down in 58 years, which is kind of a nice investment. Um, now, you know, this was a pretty good year in the stock market this past, you know, year. So if you're in the stock market, you feel good right now. But, you know, next year it might go down. And, and we, we don't worry about our investments. Uh, and so there's lots of reasons why, but, and I don't know what Joe answers when he, uh, uh, I, I believe him, and I, you know, I, even when he's gone, I don't think we will make that decision to go public. So, so if you want to own Waffle House stock, you've got to come work for us, and, uh, but when you leave, you've got to sell it back. So uh, that's, those are the rules. But uh, thank you for, uh, for having me. Well, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. Oh, thank you.